Welcome to this service uh, from St. Stephen's Norwich. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, great to have you with us. Uh, we're very much a community that uh, gathers together in this way, Sunday by Sunday, and have done now for months and months and months. And of course, this week we face uh, the realization that schools won't be going back till March the 8th. And there is a stretching out of the lockdown. But our prayer and hope is that it's for very good uh, purpose. It's really interesting that today is, is the day when we, in effect, stop uh, celebrating Christmas in, in the church calendar and turn around and look towards Lent and Easter, which is our great source of hope um, with, within Christianity. That of all, the hope of all that Jesus achieved in his resurrection. But at this moment in time, the church used to fill its dark churches with candles, and it was called Candlemas. And you can just imagine the light and the wonder of, of the candles as they, in the darkness, remember that there is light. And so at this moment in time, and as you join us in this service, my prayer is that you have a sense of light, even if it feels very dark wherever you are at the moment. And so as we gather, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you were known and seen for who you were by a few and named to being light in this world. And we thank you for that hope that you give us in darkness. Amen. And so will you join with us? I bring you good news of great joy. A saviour has been born to us. Hallelujah. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Hallelujah. He is Christ the Lord. Hallelujah. We worship and adore him. Hallelujah.
it's always good to be realistic about ourselves without being hard on ourselves. And that's what we remember every time in our service we come to confession. Christ, the light of the world, has come to dispel the darkness of our hearts. In his light, let us examine ourselves and confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbours in thought, word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so we have another video clip brought to us by the Bible Project. This this time, I, I think you will find very interesting because it tells us the nature of the literature uh, within the Bible and it indicates how it should be used. So the Bible is a collection of books written in different literary styles like narrative, poetry, and prose. And most of us are familiar with these kinds of literature. Yeah, we all know a narrative when we see one, like The Hunger Games or The Great Gatsby. And most people can recognize poetry, whether it's Walt Whitman or the songs of Bob Dylan. And every day we're surrounded by prose and news articles or essays. Now all of these examples are modern American literature in that they came from this time period and this region of the world. But there's also medieval English literature from from another place in time, or ancient Greek writings from this place in time. So each time period and culture produces its own unique kind of literature. And in order to read the Bible well, we need to keep in mind that it comes from this part of the world and was produced in this basic period of time. So what's unique about ancient Jewish literature? Well, a key feature is that it lacks a lot of the details that modern readers have come to expect in stories and poems. And this makes it seem really simple. But actually, it's very sophisticated literature. Every detail that is given matters. And that's great, but the lack of detail means that stories are often loaded with ambiguities. I mean, take one of the first stories, Adam and Eve in the Garden. Where did this talking snake come from? And why did God allow him there? Why didn't Adam and Eve die on the spot like God said they would? And who's this offspring of the woman who will destroy the snake but is bitten by it? Yeah, so many puzzles in this story. And some of these are questions that we have and that are not important to what the author is focusing on. But some of these ambiguities are in Intentional. Intentional? Won't that lead to bad interpretations, people filling in the gaps with their own answers? Well, that's a risk the biblical authors took in writing this way. We all tend to impose our own cultural assumptions onto the Bible, but they apparently thought the risk was worth it. These oddities are really invitations into an adventure of reading and discovery. What do you mean? Well, for example, the strange promise about the offspring of the woman crushing and being bitten by the snake. That word offspring is a clue to pay attention to genealogies, which, lo and behold, run all through the biblical narrative. They trace the lineage from Eve all the way to King David and his offspring. And in the New Testament, Jesus is connected to the offspring of this royal line. Now, when you read the prophets, Isaiah connected this king to the suffering servant who would die on behalf of his people. And then in the book of Revelation, there's this symbolic vision. And can you guess? It's about a woman and her offspring. It's Jesus and his followers who conquer the dragon by giving up their lives. Yeah, so each part of the story there is loaded with ambiguities, but altogether, it makes sense. 
And this is the literary genius of the Bible. It forces you to keep reading and then interpret each part in light of the others. This is feeling complicated. I don't know if I can do all that. Well, you're actually not expected to notice all of this by yourself or all at once. This dense way of writing forces you to slow down and then read carefully, embarking on this interactive discovery process through the whole biblical narrative over a lifetime of reading and rereading. Ah, okay. Meditation literature. Yeah, in Psalm 1, we read about the ideal Bible reader. It's someone who meditates on the scriptures day and night. In Hebrew, the word meditate means literally to mutter or speak quietly. The idea is that every day for the rest of your life, you slowly, quietly read the Bible out loud to yourself and then go talk about it with your friends, pondering the puzzles, making connections, and discovering what it all means. And as you let the Bible interpret itself, something remarkable happens. The Bible starts to read you. Because ultimately, the writers of the Bible want you to adopt this story as your story. So this ancient Jewish writing style, it must create unique types of narrative and poetry and discourse. Yes, and we'll explore all of those literary styles starting next with biblical narrative. Meditation doesn't have to be long and drawn out, although it can be. It can be just taking moments to reflect on what we read in scripture. And the scripture is behind much of our liturgy and it will be behind our prayer for the day too. And so we pray together. God of heaven, you send the gospels to the ends of the earth and your messengers to every nation send your Holy Spirit to transform us by the good news of everlasting life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Luke chapter 2 verses 22 to 40. Jesus presented in the temple. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord, and to offer sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marvelled at what had been said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was eighty-four. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them, at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Everyone who has been around children, and, and let's face it, quite a lot of adults as well, will be familiar with the phrase, I just can't wait. Um, as in, I just can't wait until Christmas. It signifies the fact that something amazing is going to happen, but in the future. It's a fact. It will happen, but just not yet. And so we look forward, we yearn for the day that the exciting reality actually is with us. 
I guess we can all share in the phrase, I just can't wait until this pandemic is over. And due to the ongoing vaccination programme and people largely complying with lockdown rules, it will happen, hopefully not too far away. But sadly, we're living through difficult days, probably with a few more to come whilst we wait. As I write this sermon, it's been announced that over 100,000 people have died of COVID in the UK, 1,000 of them being in Norfolk. Our reading today introduces us to two older people, Simeon and Anna. Both of them were waiting for God's promise of a Messiah, a Saviour. Simeon had been told that it would happen in his lifetime, and he was getting on in years. It must be soon. Whilst the text doesn't actually use the phrase, I wonder if they'd both said at some point, I just can't wait until God's Messiah comes. But for now, the waiting would have to continue. And the best thing they could do is to keep doing what they always did. Get on with life and get on with worshipping the God of hope, the God of miracles, the God who had promised a Messiah. Then, one day, a young couple came into the temple to do what the law commanded them to do. Actually, Luke, in verse 22, brings together three rituals. In Leviticus 12, verses 6 to 8, Mary, as a new mother, was required to purify herself after the birth. But also, this couple marked the redemption of their firstborn child, remembering the Passover, as was required in Exodus 13, and also dedicated their child to God. I wonder if you can spot the irony in this last one. Well, so far, just an ordinary day. But this was no ordinary baby. And this was no ordinary day, particularly for Simeon and Anna, as it marked the end of their wait. As the church calendar marks the end of Christmas tide today, for them, Christmas had finally come. They had seen the Messiah in that baby boy. But their praise and celebration is also tinged with reality. Whilst the wait was over, they knew that this was a game-changing event and that some in Israel just wouldn't be able to accept it. And suffering would not be far away, particularly for Mary as she watches her son's life unfold. As Israel suffered under harsh Roman rule, it became apparent this time, though, that God had chosen to suffer as well. While Jesus was accepted by some, he was rejected by many, including those who were scared of losing their power. But through suffering, through Jesus' death and his mighty resurrection, evil once and for all was defeated. He truly was the Messiah, the Saviour, not just for Israel, but for the entire world. So, as we wait for Jesus to return, as he promised he will, we can have hope in the future certainty of the Gospel. God keeps his promises. Jesus was and is the Saviour of the world. He has defeated evil. He has shown that death is not the end. Whilst suffering continues for a little while longer, one day, someday, Jesus will return to put everything right. And in the meantime, well, we just need to hang in there. 
live a life of worship, this time not in a temple, but just through our normal lives, by loving God and loving our neighbours. As Simeon and Anna pointed to Jesus as a sort of source of hope, we join in this song uh, led by Megan to do the same ourselves, to point to Jesus as our source of hope.
let us affirm our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God raised him on high and has given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Lord Jesus, light of the world, as Simeon and Anna prayed expectantly, waited eagerly, worshipped and served faithfully, fill us with your grace to follow their example, being patient and steadfast as we look to you, our light, in these difficult days. We pray for our world and the many countries thrown into turmoil by the global pandemic. We ask that those nations who have developed the technologies, resources and vaccines to combat the virus will share these, that peoples everywhere can benefit. We continue to pray for the new administration in America and those seeking unity and the common good. We pray for our nation and for our government and local government, for wisdom and good judgment as they make key decisions at this time. Lord, we again lift to you our stretched NHS staff, thanking you for their dedication and service. And we pray for those suffering with COVID-19 in our hospitals. We remember before you those for whom lockdown is not straightforward. Parents of school-aged children, the lonely, those who have lost their jobs and face an uncertain future, and those who struggle daily with mental health challenges. We pray for our church here in Norwich, for Madeline and all the team who lead and make St Stephen's what it is, asking that you will give them daily strength and encouragement as they serve us and many in the wider community. Please bless and protect them in all they do. We thank you for the ways that technology has enabled us to meet together virtually on Sundays and at different times in the week and help us to be mindful of those who are unable to do this. We pray for those who are unwell and those in need at this time, remembering particularly Peter and Jenny. Lord Jesus, Simeon proclaimed you a light revealing God to all the nations. Thank you for your life-giving light that shines for all in these dark times. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This week's Hearing from God was prompted by some reading that I was doing last week as part of my ordination training. And I was reading some um, thoughts about prayer. And one passage in particular in the book that I was reading struck me. And it said this. At the beginning of Lent, Christians traditionally receive the sign of ash on their foreheads with the sober words, remember you are dust and to dust you shall return. Repent and believe the gospel. Ashing is a universal symbol of human mortality, of grief and mourning for sin, and of penitence. But there is another symbol for this season, a complementary one. Some Greek Orthodox communities mark the start of Lent in quite a different way. For them, the first day of Lent is treated as the first outdoor day of the new year. Lent is the beginning of spring. After the long death of winter, here is the first sign that new life is coming. We must go out to greet it. The community celebrates this day by climbing the nearest hill and flying kites on the fresh spring wind. And as I read that passage, I loved the contrast of these two images, ashes and kites. It spoke to me of the two realities we experience in the life of faith, which manages to be both messy and glorious, painful and joyful, earthed in our frail humanity, but given the promise of new life by the fresh wind of the spirit. As the country remains in the grip of the COVID-19 pandemic, and this week we reach the grim milestone of 100,000 deaths, we rightly weep, grieve and mourn. At this time, it's not hard to remember that we're dust. The image in Job chapter two of a man stripped of everything dear and familiar to him, afflicted with disease, sitting in the ashes, could serve as a picture of our nation. Ashes. But in faith. Spring is coming. I'm not sure where the nearest hill to us is, hills being a bit of a challenge in Norfolk, but I've definitely seen kites dancing in the wind on the North Norfolk coast. So I know it's possible, even in this flattest of landscapes. Kites are lifted by a force greater than themselves. The invisible but undeniably present wind catches them and frees them to fly. In the book of Acts, we read of the spirit coming like a rushing wind into the upper room where the disciples had self-isolated for very different reasons to our own. And the spirit brought them hope and strength and boldness, sending them out to share the gospel of grace and truth and love. As the people of God, this remains our calling to see where the spirit takes us, to dance in the wind and to invite others to do the same. 
It may feel as though we'll be sitting in the ashes for some time yet. But let's keep our eyes open for the wind changing. Let's live hopefully, ready to follow where the spirit leads. And one day, let's go fly a kite. As we enter another week of waiting for this pandemic to be over and being concerned with any number of people that we know who are very affected by it, I pray that you will be blessed. Son of Mary, Son of God, we have joined the worship of the angels. May we never lose that heavenly vision like the shepherds. We have rejoiced at the news of your birth. Help us to proclaim that message in word and deed to your praise and glory. Amen. The word was made flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.